Thank you. Thank you. We have some questions we wanted to ask. People have been wanting to ask you about how your runs are reporters. They hear that you are not collecting money. You don't collect advice from government. <laughs> People say you are collecting money from politicians and you say you don't collect money. Some say the Sarah reporters have been run with grants. There are so many people here who want to have interest in blogging. Since I uh, across the world started, everybody across the world said every young person wants to blog. But what is lacking is the patience to grow. The product, yes. For most people, they think that once you start a blog, you just start making money. Yeah. And so having you here is an opportunity for us to have you share that experience with us. Yes. And as many young journalists that are here, so that we can have that experience moving forward. I'm sure that it's going to help us in close of us there. Thank you. you. We would like to listen to you. Sir. Yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for having me here at your headquarters. And uh, thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for taking uh, the dream that I had some 12 years ago to the next level. Uh, it was because of Sahara Reporters that I'm able to sit in front of you today to think about taking Nigeria to the next level. Uh, because when Sahara Reporters started, it started with a laptop. And when this idea of running for presidency started, it started with probably a laptop too. <laughs> Well, not a laptop, but maybe a mobile phone, you know. Uh, and the reason I said it was a mobile phone was that it actually started with a poster that was designed by a young person, which was then sent by WhatsApp. And before I knew it, it was all over the world, you know, almost instantaneously. And um, what we were doing in Sahara Reporters in those days was something that nobody thought would succeed. In fact, they used to make fun of me for two reasons. They said I was never trained as a journalist and as a result could not make it as a journalist and that secondly that internet was never going to be in Nigeria to the extent that it will make an impact to take over from the traditional mainstream media but I told them that there's a difference between mainstream media and main street media yeah. and the same way this is the same way we are doing it with politics today we are moving away from mainstream politicking to main streets you know revolutionary politicking and which is to meet people, mobilize them, conscientize them, motivate them, and get them to understand that you can sometimes bypass compensation if it's going to mortgage your future, so that you can get a better compensation for yourself and for the society that you're in. Uh, like I said, nobody could believe that anybody could set up a clean media platform, a brand that will become a global competitor without being corrupt because every other person who was doing it before me had been compromised. And some people who started after me had been compromised. I say it with due respect. Some of the guys who used to steal Sarah Reporter's content, they have mansions in this country today. That's how they started. But I don't have anything, but I have so much that I can be proud to be in front of you. Not many of them have a name anymore. Some of them have to shut down their websites because they compromise themselves. So I want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, you have to understand that 
I'm no longer going to be working with Sahara reporters. I'm looking for a new job next year. <laughs> and uh, it's a natural progression for someone like me who's worked for close to 30 years to create an enabling environment where we can de democratize the information. That was after we democratized governance. But he was very quick to do what the others were doing, stealing. You know, they started stealing Nigeria resources. I stand against any form of corruption. And I stood firmly against Jonathan stealing. When it started, people said Sahara reporters was lying. But eventually, everything became well known. Every expose we did on Jonathan is now in court. How we expose Mrs. Uh, Desiani, Kola Aloko, Jide Omokole, Stella Odua when she bought the uh, BMW, BMW and the scam she was doing building airports. You can see that the airport here, the windows are blown, the roofs are blown. These are work that we did consistently that exposed and made Nigerians understand that they cannot continue with Jonathan. So what happened at that time was that most Nigerians decided that Jonathan was such a bad job they would accept someone else. So, but this is what is most important. Through that process, we did something that was unthinkable and unheard of. We were able to use the platform to report election results on the same day of election, 10 states. It has never happened before in the history of this country. We used to wait for INEC. So our reporters reported 10 states. When INEC released their first tense, it tallied exactly with, almost exactly with what our reporters reported. Because of that, yes, because of that, we were able to have a party-to-party -party transition in the history of Nigeria. The reason why you saw Minister Rubebe did what he did was because of that report we were doing. So we, we, must, we must thank ourselves, not me alone, for making it possible to keep the democracy going. Let me tell you, if that election had been rigged, you would not have Nigeria today. And if we hadn't reported the election the way it was reported, they would have rigged it. And we'd probably be at war now, seriously. Because the winner was, would have been different from the person who won. So that's, that's where we are. Where we are is we must continue to appreciate ourselves. We must continue to appreciate our uprightness and appreciate that we can stand where it is difficult to do so. Most of you don't know where I come from, right? You just say, sure. I'm actually supposed to be closer than, to Jonathan than any one of you. But I don't have any ethnic fiber in my body. I do what my conscience tells me is right. And even Jonathan today must look back and say, if I did it differently, the country would have voted for him. I would have been able to re retire the old people. We didn't need Buhari to come back when he came back. But Jonathan and Jonathan alone is responsible for bringing Buhari to power. Do we not regret that Buhari has come to power? Yes, and that's why we are fixing it. Maybe we should also be thankful that Buhari came to power, because otherwise we would have been salivating over him. Uh, maybe if he came out, life would have been better. Now, it has made it clear to us that we don't need a PhD holder and a NEPA certificate holder. We need a Nigerian who has capacity. Right? So, and what has this done for us is putting us, putting us in the right direction for the first time for young people to actually be in control of their destiny. Yes. You don't have to stand up. You can okay. sit and talk. Thank you very much. Welcome to Calabar. Thank you. It's my first time to meet you and to know you. My name is Rangedima. I'm before this is from Makasi in Kroshiba Watch. Yes. Okay, my question is there are a lot of other young people who are interested in presidency in 2019. Yes. What are your core values? What will make you stand out? Apart from being a journalist and an activist, what will really make you stand out so that we know what you're selling for you? My selling points are things that you already know. I have pedigree, I have integrity, I have capacity, intellect. I'm exposed, widely traveled. I am very stubborn and uncompromising. <laughs> you know, I am not afraid of anybody. Take it back! Take it back. <laughs> so, and you have documented history of all of this. If you want to go to war, who would you trust? A general who has a history of fighting and winning wars. I've won against the military when it was difficult in this country to fight against military rule, I did. 
I say it with that missing words that most of the people who are in position of authority today in Nigeria, when we were fighting the military, they were hiding under their beds. Right? I'm a witness. Yes. <laughs> so now it's time for us to take our rightful place. Other young people are running. I love it. I'm happy that they have realized that young people can aspire to a political office. I am not particularly young, according because by the definition of the United Nations, I mean, the United Nations definition of the youth, I won't fall it, but you know, I'm very youthful and energetic, you know, uh, as you can see by way of my haircut. Uh, so, yeah. But the hair is the most important thing. We must not make the mistake of voting for somebody because it's a youth. It has to be a young person that has all the qualities that you are looking for. You have a right to interview us. So, for example, it's not enough to be young and say you are running and you don't go out and canvass. I don't know if you've seen a lot of young people who are running, but I have been everywhere in the country. Most of them have not left Lagos. Most of them have not left Abuja. They are just hoping that you know, uh, they are good looks, we attract. But you know, if it is good looks, I'm damn good looking too, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, but uh, those are the qualities, but most importantly, the quality we are looking for is that of governance. And I know that people who are challenging us and saying we don't have experience. It's true, we don't have the experience of uh, massive looting, stealing, assassination, election box hijacking, and all of the things that the lands which nobody is in doubt about and where we will take this country. You know, we will have a great experience starting from next year. We'll have a great experience, but we must do it. We must vote the old guards out, retire them finally, and take them. We will also take care of them. It's in their own interest that we take over power so that they can start getting their pensions on a regular basis. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Um, recently, uh, the internet was flooded with uh, conversations about the former minister of finance, Dr. Ngozi Okonjere. Yes. About the book she wrote. Yes. And about the part of late during uh, Jonathan's uh, administration. Yes. How you told, uh, as, as she said, uh, how you told Donald Duke say the. Uh, you were both in conversation not for her not to accept the ministerial appointment mm. from Jonathan Tuffman. Yes. Do you have anything to say about that? No, she's a, Mr. Okonjo Ewella is a liar, you know. Yes, I'm serious. She lied against me. The conversation I had with her, she mixed the conversation together because she wants to tell a beautiful lie. Uh, but I'm going to react to it for the first time officially today. My conversation with her was when she came the first time working under Abbasanjo, and she was collecting dollar salary. She was working in Nigeria as Minister of Finance, but she was being paid in dollars. And we were challenging her that when the dollars become Nigeria's currency. So she shamefully eventually had to abandon that dollar salary. So it was during Abbasanjo's time that I had a conversation with her. I do not know Donald Duke. I've never spoken to Donald Duke before. And I know Donald Duke is from this state. He can testify to it. I gave Donald Duke hell when he was the governor of this state. My opposition to Ms. Okonjo Iwela is that she's one of the worst finance ministers ever, ever employed by Nigeria. And in other countries, Ms. Okonjo Iwela would have been cooling her feet behind the, you know, uh, I mean in jail for what she did. She's the one who supervised all the stealing that took place under Jonathan. She supervised the stealing that took place under Abbasanjo. She gave away $18 billion to the World Bank, I mean to Paris Club and people who claim that they borrowed us money. Money that we would have used to develop this country infrastructurally. They claim that the debt refund will make Nigeria a prosperous nation. Is Nigeria prosperous after we did that? No, she lied about it. You see, Nigeria has a problem. We keep rewarding people who are incompetent, people who are mediocre, people who are, uh, who are thieves. She is a friend of the thieves. She protected the thieves. It was under her watch that all these scandals took place. And because Nigeria doesn't do what is right, she's getting away with Blue Mother. She's not supposed to be free, and I mean it, if we were in a proper country. You know that when she tried to become World Bank uh, president, she couldn't get two votes outside of Africa. Because they knew her. 
to be a dishonest person. And I challenge her, I've always challenged her to come and show me her in her successes as Nigeria's finance minister. She can't prove anything. She ran, ran away and wrote a book trying to put me, because I was one of the people who was always putting her feet to fire. One thing you should now know is that if I was one of the dishonest politicians or I mean reporters, my name would have featured as a corrupt person in her book. But I called her all the time and put her feet to fire. I called her out all the time. Whenever she claims she has policies that are working for Nigeria, I say it doesn't work for us. And this is the, this is the outcome of Ms. Okonjo Oweala's two term in office. A broken nation and a nation of citizens that are broke. She should not come and be giving us nonsense. Again, one day, I'm sure, like other people, she will pay for her crimes against the people of Nigeria while she supervised the looting of her country. One final thing I will say to you is that the people that she gave the contract to do the debt buyback, or the debt forgive, she now got a job with them. That's where she's working now. And I've done a story about it, she cannot disprove it. You know, that's what they call a rob bumble. Rob my back, I rob your back. That's the kind of economic policy the woman brought here. And if Okonji Awela was a honest person, she should be running for the president of Nigeria today. But she cannot come around here. She can only write a book and hope that the book will sell. But I'm not buying her book, and I'm not buying her BS. <laughs> All right. Yes. We take one last question before we step out. Yes. Um, we have a... Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I have two questions. Yes. In particular, when you become president, which one will you tackle first? Political corruption, financial corruption. Which one is worse? The second one. Yes. The second one is there is um, a general apprehension in the country that elections will come in 2019. Yes. But there is a fear that the present regime will rig it to perpetuate themselves. If you win and you are rigged out, what will you do? Uh, I will ask that from the first question. See, what leads to political corruption is financial corruption first. If we clamp down on financial corruption, political corruption will be reduced to nothing. Uh, people can get away with political corruption because they have what we call war chests, money that don't belong to them that they have control over. And that is why the governors win election after they rig it, but they can ask you anytime they rig election, you know what they say to you? They say go to court. Because they already know that the judges are there waiting to play the um, game and the business. So if we finish off the financial corruption thing where we close up all the loopholes and prevent them from the kind of mindless looting that happens under their watch, we would take care of political corruption. Because political corruption can actually be taken care of by technology these days. The second question you ask is if I'm rigged out, right? What I'll tell you first is, let the mass vote. Nobody can. A lot of times money will come your way. But you think about it. You know, so many people who are wealthy in Nigeria are rich. The only thing they have is money. And if the only thing you have is money, you are poorer than a church rat. And the rest of it with blogging is what they call rat race. Bob Marley said something about rat race. You remember I said, if you are in a rat race, when you win, you still remain a rat. But if you are blogging for the good of society, you would have elevated yourself to a global competitor. If you break a news that is happening here in, in uh, Bakasi, which is a global place, it is a global issue, CNN will credit you with it. Because there is a timestamp for breaking news. Nobody can go and steal it and say, I was the first. Twitter will tell who broke the news first. Facebook will tell who broke the news first. So keep pushing, and one day you'll become a globally recognized blogger. That should be your paramount interest. I do not know how to advise people to make money as a blogger. I don't know why people who want to make money want to be a blogger. But I understand because there have been a lot of bloggers who have made money by extorting money from politicians or selling themselves out cheap. What will happen to you is that, let me tell you the way politicians think. Politicians sees a blogger as a threat as long as you are not in bed with them. And there's nothing they can do to touch you. The day you compromise yourself, they will move on to the next blogger. And that's how it works. When I become president, I will never commission a road. Never. 
If the road is finished, we open it. Let people be driving on it. Because you can never see Obama commissioning a road. It's nonsense. It's part of the old rubbish we do in this country. Governors will go and commission a road. Senators. One senator commissioned an electric pole <laughs> in this country. One commissioned borehole. The other one took the borehole that's meant it for the community, put it inside this building, and commissioned it after that. So, please, I wish you the best, and I hope and continue you help to propagate our mission uh, to everybody. Take it back. Take it back. Thank you. All right.